I know with the changes to step one, making it pass fail, a lot of people are asking the questions, well, now what? What happens to step one? So in this video, let's talk about what step one is now here in 2022, as well as generally how do you study, prepare, what resources to use, as well as some templates for how to go about studying throughout the week during your dedicated period. So first, let's talk about the best mindset for the new step one exam. The first thing I would say is take a breath. Now that, the, now that it is pass-fail, all things aside, pass-fail changes. This is largely going to hopefully in the long term benefit people in the sense that there's not quite so much pressure placed on the earlier parts of your med school. The next two things I would say is that this, this exam can now be used as sort of the preparatory period for step two. So now the exams are starting to blend together. Step two is having more and more basic sciences and the, the exams are starting to cover a lot of the same content. And so this exam is best used, I think, as sort of a practice from step one to step two, and you don't have to worry so much about the score and in the initial part. And you can work on developing your clinical knowledge before you take step two. The other thing I think this would say is a lot of people take this exam within a few months of starting their clinical rotations. And a lot of the expectations as a med student coming into clinical rotations in third year is that you're expected to generally know the basic sciences. Those are the questions that you tend to get asked on rounds. And so step one can now be used largely as a preparation for clinical rotation. So I think these are two big reasons not to blow the exam off, but that the new pass fail should hopefully give us a chance to all take a breath and relax a little bit. So now that we've covered this, let's go and talk about the resources that people typically use and give them each pros and cons, as well as a rating, a final recommendation for each one. So here's the resources we're going to discuss and cover. We obviously have UWorld. We have Anki for flashcards. We have Sketchy Medical. We have Pathoma, First Aid, USMLE RX, and NBME self-assessments. Now, I know that these aren't, this isn't a comprehensive list. There are more resources out there, and some would use less, some would use more. These are all just the ones that are, are relatively popular. I want to cover these all in depth as well as talk about a final recommendation. Um, but in the end, I think that the amount and the resources you use specifically are should be tailored to your, your preferences and what seems to help you learn the best. So the first one, the gold standard, UWorld, it has over 3,600 questions now, spans all subjects. And I think the top tier reason why UWorld is still the best resource out there is the answer explanations. They get you into the mind of a test maker and what they're thinking about more than any other question bank or resource that I've ever found. They've now added the option to create flashcards within UWorld itself, so you don't have to use Anki if you if you are inclined to use Anki. Um, and you're also able to track your progress and see what percentages you're getting on each block, how those are progressing over time, as well as how you're doing on subjects. It'll also highlight your weak areas so you can group your subjects by lowest percent correct and you can see how you're doing in your weaker subjects as well and study those more effectively. So the pros, the in-depth answer explanations are vital. If you spend adequate time on these explanations, you will improve faster than any other way through any of the other resources out there. And in, in that sense, it's also truly comprehensive. It's probably the only resource on this list you could solely do UWorld and still be okay. So it's one of those that's just a game changer and always a must use. The cons, it can be difficult, especially earlier and dedicated, and it can be demoralizing. So initially, especially if you haven't started with another question bank, don't be demoralized with the fact that you're not starting where you'll finish. And sometimes people say that the concepts are similar, but the wording themselves may be different. The NBME question writers may sometimes write like UWorld question writers, and other times they may not. So really learn the concepts from UWorld, but also be willing to adapt and know the wording of NBME and that it's different. So obviously the final recommendation score is 10 out of 10, and it's the only resource that can be used by itself. So let's move on to the next one. We have Anki, the classic loved and hated by many. Flashcart app helps you memorize information effectively. You can customize it. It's free. Um, and it, if it used correctly, it can solidify information in a great way. So the biggest pros are that the system schedules your practice based on your preference preferable timing. So you can look up ways to schedule those online um, and it best ensures you never forget a concept and spaces the repetition out for yourself. So you never have to say, well, what do I need to study today? It basically does that for you. You break it down and it decides that for you each day. 
The cons, especially starting out, the volume can be intimidating. You see the total amount of cards and you think, I could never do that. There's no way I could cover that much material. Um, and without knowing the basics, the interface can also be daunting. A lot of people think that you have to be very tech savvy. Um, and then it can be tedious. If you do it every day, it can get kind of exhausting. So what I'd say is I'd look through some basic tutorials online. And if you just think about the 30, 40 handful of cards you need to do per day and look at it that way and keep your head down and look at the day by day rather than the big picture, you'll see in a couple weeks to a couple months, you'll cover massive grounds of information. And I think it's the best way, the, the quote I would use for Anki is it's the best way to prevent yourself from forgetting material. That's the, that's the primary and best use for it. So I'd give it a final recommendation of a 9.5 out of 10. I'd highly recommend it or other sources of spaced repetition. Whether or not you want to use Anki is up to you. I just think it's the best one out there and it's also free. Next, we have Sketchy Medical. Um, the concept, it uses mind palaces, puts a picture in front of you, and it uses those pictures to create a visual memory that you can recall. Um, it covers micro farm and path, and biochem is also there now that it's newer. And the narrators, especially in the path section, often explain pathophysiology in details. So you're not just memorizing a picture, it also helps you kind of understand what's happening, kind of in the same way that pathoma does, which we'll talk about later. And it offers the final picture if you want to skip the video. So if you want to just see the highlights with the numbers, you can also do that. So the pros of Sketchy is it makes force feed memorization easy, which is an enjoyable, which is a huge part of what comes on step one. And just like Anki, it enhances long-term memory. If you think about some sketches from two, three years ago, you'll be surprised at the stuff you remember versus just random facts that are in your head floating around. Um, and I think Sketchy Path is extremely underrated. So don't underrate Sketchy Path. The videos are longer but you get more out of the videos. The narrator spends a lot more time going through each disease process rather than just memorizing individual facts. So I think Sketchy Path is highly underrated. The cons, it's hard to appreciate the value till you try it. I know I underappreciated it. It seemed kind of comical, which because it is supposed to be sort of humorous, um, but I think it's best combined with a structured review resource like Anki. If you can space out your review of each picture and see the picture repeatedly over weeks to months, those pictures will never leave your head, which is exactly what you want on the exam when your mind tends to blank. So the final score I'd give Sketchy is 9 out of 10. I think what's daunting is when you start dedicated and you haven't ever used it. So I think that if you try it and use, get at least a baseline and cover as much of the material as you can before you start dedicated, then you can use something like Anki or just go through the videos systematically on your own, you can re-review it and cover each concept again, but you already have the videos down as you're doing your practice questions. And here we have Pathoma, loved by many, the one of the core resources many people use. So it's video lectures that focus specifically on the thought process behind each high yield pathology concept. So it doesn't cover biochemistry or many physiology concepts, and there's some low yield path that's being added to step one that hasn't been covered by pathoma yet. But I think the biggest pro of pathoma is it helps you understand the concepts instead of memorize them. What Dr. Zatar does is cover the material that he does cover at the highest quality that any other resource may cover it. Um, and additionally, chapters one through three are must. I know people tend to repeat these sections right before their step one exam, because it's covered in such high detail and it's so high yield. These questions, his concepts from Pathoma 1 through 3 often come back as direct word for word quotes from his lectures. Um, the cons are that the information that he does cover is finite. So there's plenty of material that you'd be missing if you did only Pathoma, but you can get the, a strong sense of your basics from doing Pathoma alone. Um, and without the video, if you just use the book on its own, it's not nearly as helpful. It's very factoid. You need the explanations and his thought process to be able to use the book effectively. So I give this a 9 out of 10, and it really is essentially amazing at what it does do, but 9 out of 10 because it's not comprehensive. So if you just said, I'm going to do Pathoma by itself, you probably would be missing some of the resources and material you need to fully cover everything that's on step one. First aid. The Holy Grail. So this book covers, in the difference than Pathoma, it's more comprehensive. It's the most commonly used resource. 
Um, and I think of it as sort of a step one dictionary. So it's got tables and pictures that can help you reason through difficult concepts and anything that you can think of that would be on step that's is even remotely high yield is probably in first aid. So a lot of people say, if it's not in first aid, I don't need to know it, which changes every year, but it's, I think of it best as a step one dictionary. So the best way to use it, I think as it's pros are as a central reference resource. So the pictures and charts are extremely high yield. You can put them in your flashcards. You can refer to them back as a way to remember difficult concepts. And it's always good to refer from it. But I think the cons are when people try and use it as a primary learning resource. So I say, imagine learning English from a dictionary. That's not a realistic way to learn the English language, much as studying for step reading through first aid is just a very, very challenging way to learn how to study for step one. The best way to do it is practice questions and use first aid as a reference rather than trying to just memorize everything in first aid and go through it systematically. So reading it cover, cover to cover is a very inefficient way to use your dedicated period. So I would best use it doing flashcards and questions and supplement when you need to reference back to first aid. And you'll be surprised how much of first aid you know just from doing questions and flashcards. So the final recommendation, nine out of 10, just because of its comprehensiveness, as well as all of the high yield pictures and charts, but it's not very well used as a primary learning resource. Then we have USMLE RX, which goes hand in hand with first aid. So it was created by the makers of first aid. It directly refers to pictures of first aid and answer explanations, which can be really helpful. It also is considered much easier than UWorld and the real step one exam, which is a pro and a con. So it's great because you can use USMLE RX as a study tool during your preclinical courses, especially if your exams are tailored or they're pre-made NBME questions or as like a warm-up QBank before starting UWorld. Many times people are afraid of doing UWorld because you're, you're afraid of how your scores are gonna look and you're afraid of being demoralized. This is a great way to start, cover your basics, understand the generally how you approach these questions, and then you start UWorld. So that's a great way to use it. I think the biggest con and the contrast to UWorld is the answer explanations are extremely lacking. So it tends to emphasize memorization than other, rather than understanding, which goes hand in hand with first aid. First aid is a large book of facts with great ways to sort of put it all together in charts, but using it to understand the material can be really challenging. So it also, because it's directly tying into first aid, it can be very comprehensive. It just may not go into the depth or difficulty that step one does. And for that reason, I gave it an eight out of 10, that it's a great and very well and I would highly recommend it, but I would not use this as the primary resource to study for step one, especially not as your question bank. And then last here, we have the NVMe self-assessments. So these are good for additional questions. They're extra practice, and especially with the vague NVMe language. Many people show up to the exam or do an NVMe practice question, practice test, and it feels so different than UWorld. Sometimes UWorld over explains in the practice question, and so you have so much to go on. And NBME can sometimes be the opposite. It'll be one, two, three facts, and then it'll give you answer choices. There'll be minimal information, and it's just a, do you know it or do you not? And so this gets you practice with that uncomfortable feeling you have when it's just a matter of knowing it or not. So the answer explanations are historically limited, but they've been slowly but surely adding explanations. Um, and then I think the projected score at the end is variable, um, and it gives you general areas of weakness and strength as well. So I think the pros is this is direct practice from the NVMe question writers. So it's not the exact same browser. So don't go into the exam thinking that the step one exam is going to look exactly like this exam does. It looks a little different visually, but in terms of the wording, it can be very helpful. The cons are the predictability varies. Newer exams tend to be more difficult and underestimate your score because they're new and these exams are based on curves. And so when, when questions are brand new, there's not a lot of data. The individual strengths and weaknesses section, it is really not that useful. If you've taken any NBA me exam before, you know that it, it doesn't give you any information. It just says average, above average, or below average, and it's comparing you to yourself. So it's not really that helpful. So I think that's a huge weakness that they'll hopefully work on. But in terms of its preparation for getting comfortable with NBME question writers, I think it's great. And so I give this an eight out of 10. I would highly recommend it. But again, I wouldn't do this as the primary resource. This is sort of a supplement in addition to your UWorld as your primary resource. So now we've covered all of the resources. Let's go ahead and talk about dedicated strategy. Um, so the first thing I would say is the easier QBank like USMLE RX is a great way to start. 
because the primary thing we need to be doing to take a test that involves questions is to be doing questions. And so as you get comfortable or you say, hey, I've mastered Rx, you can transition to UWorld. And so I would think that that's the best way to do it. You can start with Rx, maybe stagger it, do a couple of Rx and UWorld, and then transition fully to UWorld. Um, a tip for reviewing, I would spend at least as long as reviewing the questions as you are answering them, but ideally even one and a half times as long. Um, if you spend the extra time reviewing the answers, the right answers, the wrong answers, you'll find yourself later on future questions that different iterations of those same questions that have a slightly different answer pathway, you'll know the answer to those just as well as you knew the answer to the previous one. And that all comes by spending time reviewing the questions. So I think people tend to structure UWorld self-assessments and NBME practice exams throughout their dedicated period. I think that's a great way to do it. And I've really emphasized prioritizing active learning early and often. Many people try to experiment with various different resources. It can kind of be information overload. But I think if you use practice questions, flashcards, and other methods of active recall and say, that's going to be my primary resource and anything else is supplementary, I think you'll be greatly set up to do well. And I'd say most people take between four to eight weeks on average. Now that pass fail has happened, I think that's variable. I think that's up to you. If you feel really strong in your knowledge, have been doing questions before starting dedicated, you may need a shorter period. But if you haven't ever done any questions and you're starting from scratch and you may need a little bit more time. So it's all individually tailored, I would say. So here's an example study week that I created. Um, this is just generally how I would structure my day. So I would focus on maybe two resources in any given day as your content. I would start the day off with questions. So I would do one to two blocks of UWorld. I would review them all morning, maybe take a lunch break, and then I would spend the afternoon in content review. I think being able to wake up early, do questions is going to be simulate your test day, as well as it's when you're most fresh. And then in the afternoon, when you can sort of wind down, you can use your content. So I'd pick two maybe big content resources space it out throughout the week and systematically cover them. So for this example, I did Sketchy and Pathoma, but that may be Boards and Beyond and Pathoma. That may be First Aid, Pathoma, whatever you want to do. Just make sure you systematically cover the resource throughout your schedule. And so I split it into, so if you see Pathoma here, the chapters, Intro Path, Inflammation, Neoplasia. So it covers each individual section. And so you're able to get through the whole book through your studying. And I also have Anki set up here as well so that you're dedicating time to doing flashcards to review the things you do wrong, to also just review the basic concepts as well. It's a supplement, but I think flashcards are also very important. And then many people do one big self-assessment per week or maybe per other week, and then give yourself the seventh day either off or as a day just to review that self-assessment. So this is, a, I think, a general structure that can be very helpful. The structure is based all around doing practice questions, and then everything else is supplementary to that. So if you're able to, if you fall behind and you need to cut out a section of your review content, that's, that's okay. The primary thing you should be focused on is getting through your questions and being efficient and learning as best as you can from those. So let's do some commonly asked questions and answers, and we'll also... So the first one here is, is it worth doing the NVMe free, free 120? I would say absolutely yes. Many people have reported word for word repeats on the exam. So this is definitely worth doing, especially as it's pass fail. Any free, free questions will be great to help you feel a little bit more confident about passing the exam. The next question I see here a lot is, is it still worth it to study hard with step one being pass fail? I would say yes. Step two CK right now is still scored. And as the exams overlap more and more and more, preparation for step two, step one becomes preparation for step two. And it's just, it's gearing yourself up for that and you're putting yourself in a good position. And so the next question is, what if you feel burnt out while studying for step one? I think now with the changes, prioritizing wellness and taking a step back are really important. So now with the pass fail, this is now a marathon instead of a sprint. And so there's no need to burn yourself out going too hard to try and achieve the highest step one score you can. I think it's more important to prioritize your learning. And if you do feel burnt out, take a step back and um, live your life as best as you can and you're dedicated. I know that's easier said than done. The next question is, are the new topics worth reviewing in detail? I would say very much yes. If you think about the new MCAT, the psych-soc section, it, because it was new, it tended to be a, 
overlooked section of the test and those who could do well on that section tended to really, really be able to increase their score. So I think the new concepts are, aren't studied as frequent, frequently, so it's a great chance to use this understanding on step two um, where it's actually scored and obviously doing, doing it to pass on step one as well. So what is the number one thing you can do to be prepared for step one? I would say prioritizing practice questions and detailed review above all else. I think if you do that and are constantly learning and then using a resource to space out that learning so that in a week you don't forget that concept, I think if you do that systematically over a period of time, you'll be hard pressed to not succeed that way. How do you stop missing questions on similar content over and over again? So I think if you make flashcards on your incorrect questions, whether that's in UWorld, whether that's through Anki, whether that's through Quizlet, whether that's writing them down, whatever the case may be, that tailored to your weaknesses is for you specifically. And so you can learn from the things you missed. And in three months, you know that same fact like it was yesterday. The difference between that and in reviewing it once is that in three months, you will have no idea what it was that you missed. Um, so what if you haven't covered some of the larger content resources before dedicated, sketchy, boards and beyond, et cetera? So I think each resource has limited utility. And if you're overwhelmed with resources, because there are so many, choose two to three that work well, that help you understand the material, and focus on those. You don't have to spend excess amounts of time doing every resource in existence. You can do one question bank, a couple of content, whatever the case may be, pick the resources you're going to use and stick with them while they're working. Then the last one here, is it worth it to start Anki and Dedicated even if you haven't started the pre-made decks beforehand? I know a lot of people get to Dedicated, aren't seeing improvement and feel the pressure to start Anki. I think it's always helpful to start Anki if you haven't before. I know the volume of it can be intimidating, but even if you're able to do a tiny amount per day, that adds up to a lot of cards over the course of four to eight weeks. So as many of the pre-made cards as you can cover, or making the cards on your incorrect questions is a game changer. And I think if you're in dedicated and you've hit a plateau and you aren't doing flashcards, if you try, even if you spend 30 minutes a day doing flashcards, I think you'll see great improvement in how you're doing in your progress. So this is all that I had for the common questions and answers. But if you have more questions, always ask them in the comments and I will try and get to them as well. I know I didn't cover everything. Um, so that's all for this video for step one with the past failed changes. So let me know in the comments if you found this sort of video helpful, and we'll be sure to try and cover similar videos and other videos that you find interesting as well in the future.